want to preach a two-word sermon that I have shared with you four or five years ago. The first word is great. The next word is but, and there's a comma between the two. Great, comma, but. I think one of the things that <clears throat> we have to finally admit about life whether we are thinking of our individual lives or whether we are thinking of our collective lives, is that there is a disturbing incompleteness and an agonizing partialness about it. We can't say about anybody or any two institution or any man-made structure or thing the word great and just leave it there. We can never use the word great in an unqualified sense. following almost every affirmation of greatness is the conjunction but. And so every affirmation of greatness is followed not by a period symbolizing completeness, but by a comma punctuating its nagging partialness. Now in the Old Testament we read that passage about a man named Naaman. You've heard of him, if you've read, I should say, you should have heard of him. People don't read the Bible too much these days, so when a preacher talks about the Bible, he's usually telling people something new. I was asking somebody the other day where the book of Revelation was found, and they told me it was in the Old Testament and thought the book of Genesis was in the New Testament. So I have to assume that some of you don't know Naaman, but that is the passage in the Old Testament which says Naaman was a great man, but, and behind that but is something tragic and disturbing, it goes on to say, but he was a leper. Naaman was a great man, but he was a leper. This is the tragic story of life. It is a tragic story of so much of man's individual life. It is a tragic story of so much of man's collective life. And as we look back through the long corridors of history, over and over again, we must say about nations and civilizations that this is a great nation, but 
Greece was a great nation, left so much to the history of the world. Mrs. King and I were in Athens, Greece, not long ago, and we went up on the Acropolis. And there we stood around that magnificent Parthenon, which has stood now for so many centuries. And I could not help but carry my mind back across those centuries and think about the fact that some of the greatest minds of history assemble right around that Parthenon. Greece was a great nation. It gave to the world the poetic insights of Aeschylus Sophocles and Euripides that gave to mankind the philosophical insights of Plato, Aristotle, and Socrates that gave to the world the oratorical power of a Demosthenes that gave to the world the historical insights of a Thucydides. The whole of mankind is in debt to Greece for its greatness, in debt to Greece for making all of us heirs to a legacy of knowledge. Greece was a great nation, but, and behind that but stands the fact that Greece was a, an aristocracy for some of the people and not a democracy for all of the people. Behind that but stands the fact that Greece was built by and large, the city-states were built on the backs of slaves. Greece was a great nation, but She made God's children slaves. We don't have to go back that far. Western civilization is a great civilization. Think of what Western civilization has done. It has given to the world the magnificent insights of the Renaissance. Think of what Western civilization has given to the world in terms of music. Given to the world the glad thunders and the gentle signs of a handle. The melodious sweetness of the music of a Beethoven. The charming melodies of Bach. Then all of the power of the Industrial Revolution which came right through Western civilization. Through Western civilization, man started his trek toward the city of material fulfillment and material prosperity, Western civilization is a great civilization, but, and I don't want you to forget this morning what stands behind that agonizing, tragic incompleteness Behind that but is the fact that Western civilization has exploded and trampled over millions of God's children through colonialism. I stood over and over again in Westminster Abbey 
in London, England. Westminster Abbey is that great cathedral standing in all of its overpowering aesthetic beauty and charm. One of the great cathedrals of the Church of England. Whenever I stand there, I have a kind of dual experience. On the one hand, I'm carried away by the enrapturing Gothic architecture and all of the beauty of that cathedral. But on the other hand, I have to stand there and think about the fact that for years, for centuries, the British Empire dominated politically, exploited economically, segregated and humiliated millions of God's children over the world, and the Church of England never really took a stand against it. You stand in Westminster Abbey, you see that all of the kings and queens have been buried there. But what was the church talking about? When men were being brutalized through the process of colonialism, what was the church doing when men were being trampled over by the iron feet of oppression? Western civilization is a great civilization, but she has trampled over human personality. She has allowed the means by which she lives to our distance the ends for which she lives. She has ended up minimizing the maximum and maximizing the minimum. She has ended up allowing her civilization to outrun her culture. She has allowed her technology to our distance, her theology. She has allowed her mentality to outrun her morality. A Western civilization is a great civilization, but behind that but stands something tragic. Now I want you to know that America is a great nation. America is a great nation. We started out here as a nation back in 1776. Just think of the foundation upon which we stood. You can read about it, it's beautiful. The house was solidly structured idealistically. We hold these truths to be so evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those are some bread words. Just the universal aspect of the word should strike one. It didn't say some men, it said all men. It didn't say all white men, it said all men, which includes black men. It didn't say all Gentiles, it said all men, which includes Jews. It didn't say all Protestants, it said all men, which includes Catholics. And then it said something else that's beautiful. Something that distinguishes this nation from totalitarian forms of government. It says that every individual has certain basic rights that are neither derived from nor conferred by the state. In order to discover where they came from, it is necessary to move back behind the dim mist of eternity. They are God-given. Very seldom, if ever, in the history of the world, has a socio-political document 
expressed in such profound, eloquent, and unequivocal language the dignity and the worth of human personality. America is a great nation. And then look at what we've done scientifically, scientifically and technologically. Yes, we've built machines that think. An instrument that peered into the unfathomable ranges of interstellar space. Just look at what we've done. We've built gargantuan bridges to span the seas and gigantic buildings to kiss the sky. Just look at what we've done through our spaceships. We've been able to carve highways through the stratosphere. Good God Almighty, you can leave Seattle, uh, Tokyo, Japan on Sunday morning now and arrive in Seattle, Washington on the preceding Saturday night. And when your friends meet you at the airport and ask you when you left Tokyo, you will have to say, I left tomorrow. That's the kind of world we live in. <laughs> Through our airplanes, we've dwarfed distance and placed time in change. It isn't a usual thing for a preacher to quote Bob Hope, but Bob Hope has talked about this dread age. Yes. Said it's an age in which you can take a nonstop flight from New York City to Los Angeles, California, a distance of about 3,000 miles, and if on taking off in New York, you develop hiccups, you will hitch in New York and cup in Los Angeles, California. That's moving pretty fast. America is a great nation. No, there were years not too long ago. Diseases were rampant. We couldn't do nothing about them. Man confronted plagues. He died from sudden diseases just a few years ago that the wonder drugs came into being to deal with now. Diseases that took men and women to their graves 30 years ago. Many of them can be dealt with in a few hours now. Because of the skills and the discoveries and the developments of medical science, Look at America and think of what she's done. America is a great nation, but this morning I can't leave you without dealing with what stands behind that tragic thing. America doesn't deal with that. I'm convinced that God will bring down the curtains on this nation, the curtains of doom. America is a great nation, but for 244 years, he kept millions of God's black children in slavery. America is a great nation, but for years after slavery, kept millions and to this day continues to keep millions of God's children in poverty in despair, and in hopelessness. And you know there are times that you reap what you sow in history. America must resolve this race problem, or this race problem will doom America. You know somebody had better go out and tell those white brothers devoid who are devoid of vision. It isn't but one way to deal with it. And that is to make genuine equality a reality for the black man. In other words, we just got to learn to live together. It's as simple as that. America is a great nation, but Man is great. You can think of symphony and compose it. 
think up a great civilization and go out and create it. Man is great. He has a mind. He has a memory. So he can latch on to the past and he has imagination and he can latch on to the future. Man is a dreamer. He can dream dreams. Dogs live their days. Lions live their days. Tigers live their days. Foxes live their days. But they're all guided by instinct. They don't have a way to connect with the future. And therefore, you don't see them sitting around working out geometry and algebra. You've never seen a group of dogs sitting around discussing philosophy because they're devoid of speech. Man has linguistic capacity. Man is great. And just look at him because of his mind. You can't hem him in. You just can't hold him in nowhere. He can be in one city physically and in another city at the same time. You can't hold him in. You can't hem him in. He has a mind. He can sit in Atlanta, Georgia this morning and be in New York City at the same time. He has a mind that will break through walls. You can bring him down in his wretched old age so that he can hardly walk. And his vision is going, but he takes his mind rise and breaks through time and space and imagines that he hears the very angels singing. And he comes back, his name is Handel, and scratches across the pages of history a hallelujah chorus. You can't hold him down. Man is great. Look at man and see how great he is. Man is God. Great creation. Look at what he has done and what it can do. But the tragedy is that I must come on in now and say, man is great, but the same men who will use their minds to engage in the insights of science will use their minds to make napalm and use their hands to burn up little children with that napalm in Vietnam. Same men and the same women that will use the algebra and their geometry to discover new insights will use the airplane to rain down bombs on human beings and kill God's children. Man is great, but we know truth and yet we lie. We know we ought to be just and yet we are unjust. We know we ought to love, and yet we hate. We know we ought to follow the road that is high and noble, and yet we walk the low road. We know we ought to be pure, and yet we're impure. We are unfaithful to those that we ought to be faithful to. All we like sheep have gone astray. Man is great, but he's a sinner. That's where I want you to end with me this morning. Because God didn't call us for this. But this is where we are. Man is great, but he's a sinner. In need of God's divine grace. And I don't know about you this morning. When I delved into the inner chambers of my own being. When I delve into the life of mankind. I don't end up saying with the Pharisee, I thank thee, Lord, that I'm not like other men. But I end up saying, Lord, be merciful unto me, a sinner. No sins that I'm able to escape. I'm just thankful for it when I look at dope addicts. I just say to myself, Lord, I'm thankful this morning, but for the grace of God, there I go out. Oh, yes, and I see an alcoholic. I don't stand up in arrogance, but I stand up in thankfulness saying, Lord, if it wasn't for your grace, I may be in the same situation. 
I'd go through the prisons and move down death row. I don't go down to arrogance, but I just say, thank you, Lord. Yeah. But for your grace, I too would be on death's row. Yeah. Man is great, but he's a sinner. Lord, this morning, this is why I'm thankful to God. We must open our lives to him. Let him work through Jesus Christ in our being, and he can remove that butt from our lives. And one day men will be able to say that this is a good man. This is a just man. This is an honest man. This is a man who really loves in his heart because God has worked in him. This is why I can sing an amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saves a wretch like me. I once was lost, yes I was, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. You know, that's another thing I like about grace. It causes your heart to fear, but somehow it relieves those fears. And I want to tell you to this moment, I've been through many dangers in my day. And there are many of us lying ahead but it's going to be grace. Yeah. Through many dangers, holes and snares, yeah. I have already come. But I'm not worried about the future because I know about the grace of God. Yeah. Yeah. The grace of God can transform dark yesterdays into bright tomorrows. Yeah. The grace of God can make you somebody. Yeah. The grace of God can transform Form a Simon of sand into a Peter of rock. Yeah. The grace of God can transform a persecuting Paul into an apostle Paul. Yeah. The grace of God can make you love everybody. And you begin to say in your heart, I love everybody. Yeah. In my heart, in my heart. You will rise up this morning and go on out of here with me and decide in your heart that you're going to ask God and ask Jesus Christ to make you a Christian. The nagging butt will be removed from behind that light of mixed upness and confusion. Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart, in my heart. Lord, I want to be more loving in my heart. Lord, I want to be like Jesus in my heart, in my heart. Lord, I just want to walk upright in my heart, in my heart. And when we believe that God will give us the power, you have the faith, he has the power. And it is through this power that we are able to say and live and believe in something that makes us truly great children of the Almighty God.